Today, our focus will be a bit on humor in poetry and song, among other things. And uh, since I mentioned the crew here, I would like to start the morning by sharing two haiku, poems that were written by one of our crew, who isn't able to be here today. His name is John Ritz, and he's another addition, wonderful addition of our staff here. And what I found out um, when I was making a call out for poetry from the crew, because I'm always waiting, I know any day now they're going to start writing poetry here, is that John's a company, a corporate company um, in Canton, Massachusetts, uh, puts out a call for haiku poetry from the staff, and they have different programs of the arts there. This gives you a little view into John's world at work and at home. The first haiku goes like this. Beyond the window, blue hills turn red, brown, white, green. It's a long meeting. <laughs> the second is perhaps when John is home after work. And from what I understand, he has a house that is surrounded by forest. And John writes, My neighbors now see through trees undressed by autumn. So I must wear pants. <laughs> <laughs> X.J. Kennedy, author of dozens of books of poetry, children's poetry, textbooks, and recipient of numerous awards for his writing, a Guggenheim, a Guggenheim and NCTE Award for Children's Poetry, the 2009 Robert Frost Prize for Lifetime Achievement in Poetry, to name a few. And so, X.J. Kennedy came to the lead of the Light Brigade and those members, including poets Joanne, Joan Kimball, Barb Crane, Amy Woods, Bob Clausen. All of diverse backgrounds and life experiences including someone who's a writer of book reviews, someone who's a landscape quilt artist, someone who's a potter and sculptor teaching at Harvard, someone who's worked in business as a fisherman and a teacher, someone who started writing poetry at age 70, someone who's written for many years and been a professor of poetry across the country. All of these have been published in numerous journals and books out there all have the common ground of being readers and writers of not only the serious poetry, but the lighter side of poetry as well. Their first performance as The Light Brigade with X.J. Kennedy began in 2007. One of their favorite moments in sharing poetry when a family in the front row could not stop laughing through the whole presentation. <laughs> not an easy task if you've ever studied comedy. Not only is this group getting people to laugh and pay attention to what is funny in this life, but they're getting people who love poetry to love it more and to respect the diversity of it. And they're getting people who never knew or loved poetry before to laugh, love, care, read more poetry, perhaps write their own. And I believe make this world a bit of a better place. When asked why this group thought it was important to share humor and poetry, I received a number of interesting responses, and I will share with you one from Amy Woods, who said, poetry deals with important questions. Where do we come from? Why are we here? What comes afterward? And then she responded, humor consoles us when we come to the conclusion that we haven't a clue. <laughs> so, Please help me give a warm morning welcome to XJ Kennedy and the Light Brigade. I'd like to begin with um, two poems about disease. Bird flu. I thought that that was what they were supposed to do. Swine flu. I doubt, but that's what they're supposed to do. 
I want you to think now of one of those middling Wall Street brokers who was filled with gusto a few years ago. A time for sacrifice. So little time, so little to see in this bleak year of austerity. No more Chateau Montrachet, no Brie. It's back to cheddar cheese, to screw top jugs of Cabernet. For Kate, my lab, year of the fleas. My cherished Porsche Cabriolet, this is her year on cinder blocks. Muffy, adieu to haute couture and tanning jaunts to Saint-Tropez. I'll forgo the tucks in the window at Brooks, and yes, all the benefit balls this year. Yet I feel in my bones and my bonds a new boost as I dust off my uncut, leather-bound Proust. I heard that phrase, I have no idea, in Mom's poem about poop. I have a lot of trouble with that phrase, particularly when someone who should be knowledgeable uses it, such as someone in th at, the, at the fish counter, when I ask, are those scallops cape scallops or sea scallops? And get the answer, I have no idea. <laughs> there are some places where it's justified, however. In this poem, there are two words that you might not understand, so I'll help. Uh, one is sable, and, and that's the hair of a painter's brush. And the other is rose matter. Uh, each of those natural substances, rose matter being a, a pigment. Still life. My wife of 30 years paints a picture of a turnip, an eggplant, and an onion. Behind them, a male and female couch potato stare at the arrangement as if it were TV. The rutabag is perfect. The eggplant gleams, swollen onyx. The woman on the divan leers. The sable darts at the Spanish bulb. I watch its breath lift a scrap of skin. How do you do that, I beg my wife of 30 years. She stares at me as if I were the fellow on the couch. She daubs rose matter on my nose. I have no idea. <laughs> This next story comes down from Ovid's Metamorphosis, and it's about um, Arachne, who uh, competed with Minerva in a weaving contest, and uh, the judges had them tied. And so Minerva hit Arachne with a stick, her shuttle, and uh, Arachne went home and committed suicide. It's one of those funny Ovid tales. And, and Minerva... Uh, <laughs> Minerva um, decided that the punishment was too cruel, and so she turned Arachne into a spider. spider, yes. And this is Arachne's blues. I got those eight-legged blues. My man can't stand me buying shoes. Got those eight-stick-leggy blues. He freaks when I buy shoes. I'm just hanging around here wishing that my man might understand. He say, don't need no extra colors, no red, green, blue, or gold. He say, don't buy those fancy colors, red, blue, green, or gold so bright. He say, them black pumps in your closet do you fine, don't buy no white. <laughs> but when he takes me dancing and I wears my black silk threads, oh yeah, he takes me dancing and I strut my black silk threads. He say, baby, you need color. You be looking like you're dead. So I needs to do some shopping, kill those eight-legged blues. Yeah, I gots to find a shoe store, no more stick-leggy blues. I be buying four pair to a group, shoe man, red, green, black, and blue. Now, I got me some stilettos, got some mules and slingbacks, too. Got me patent leathers, spike heels, got me flats and espadrilles. I got Gucci's and Versace's, yeah, two pair of Jimmy Choo's. Well, my man checks my shoes closet, 
and he finds 16 new pair. Oh, he's snooping in my closet, 16 new pair lying there. Say, woman, got yourself some nerve. I could beat you with a stick. It's time I put my foot down. You ain't buying no more shoes. That's my foot you're hearing, mama. You and Mel the days are through. <laughs> Daddy comes to putting feet down. I got eight, and you got two. <laughs> uh, this next is about a medical procedure uh, where you're examined uh, with a fibroscope, uh, and it enters through a uh, your nether regions into your colon. It's called sigmoidoscopy, which was the old term for the short form, now called colonoscopy. I wrote this years and years ago. Sigmoidoscopy, there's one thing I should note before this. When you get this particular procedure, they have to pump air into your colon to widen it enough for the camera. So there's a consistent hissing sound. Sigmoidoscopy. <laughs> he who having used the outer light and can return to the inner light is thereby preserved from all harm. Lao Tzu. She said an artist would love this, the gastroenterologist. What? The entry or the exit? This Ansel Adams of the anus, connoisseur of horizonless pink inscapes, probes, probes, and probes, blasting air into the tunnel to illuminate its turns, the slick translucencies that wall the creeping capillaries straining to be purple on my palate. Doctor, are those yellow spots corn? No, she answers, this looks terrific. They're just pieces of fecal matter. Never did I dream that fecal matter would highlight the only film in which I've starred. <laughs> Clausen, Clausen in his own colon, for 15 minutes famous, but alone, so alone, on the outside, looking in. <laughs> this is a very scatological day. <laughs> All my life, I've had trouble accessing the information inside my brains. Recently, I've noticed that my friends are starting to have the same trouble. It occurred to me that suddenly it's a level playing field, a fact which quite cheered me up. Not only that, but since I've been dealing with this problem all my life, I might even have an advantage. One upsmanship. My life's been one long senior moment. Yes, I've been on the cutting cusp. Only now driven daft to distraction are my poor friends catching up. Oh, the people they've forgotten, whose names they aced while young. While well, I still have them dangling there, right on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> How they'll lose their glasses, now there's no one left to blame. Who'll spot them, stapled on their foreheads? None but good old what's-her-name. <laughs> I should beg pardon for such one-upsmanship, for getting so hoity-toity. But yet, why fret when we'll all soon forget this little schadenfreude? <laughs> the inquisitive gourmet. They say... That Amy adores entertaining. Her organ specialties are wholesome, sustaining. When a guest in her kitchen, take care. She's on a mission. Beware of her picking your brains. <laughs> a withering critique, or the instructor loses it. Would-be memoirist, you'd have us rebite? This trite, dried-out slice of your life? I'm fed up, having gagged it down twice. Unnutritious, unmalicious, Svebox slice. Always right, always nice. Always nice. Get a life. Then you might, I repeat only might, even think to attempt a rewrite. 
<laughs> Generation next. Today's youth go looking for taboos, but none are left. Desperately, they ask, what can't we do? <laughs> they skew their flesh accruing accru lewd tattoos, wear pantyhose over their clothes, stretching to be rude. Less acceptable, but screwier than going nude. Nudes copycat? Bro, face facts. Mom and dad did that. Ew. <laughs> Hello? Pantyhose? Also yesterday, dude. What's next, they text in protest, stay at home and brood, to be accused of lassitude. Ooh, unfair, untrue, our retrospective sit-in, misconstrued. It's Halloween, trick or treat, sick. I know a few, their moms enthuse. With her approval, who'd be in the mood? No rules to break, blatant solicitude. And you wonder today's youngsters feel screwed? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever come up with a perfect thing to say after the fact? This poem is someone who sends back an esprit d'escalier from the afterlife, his death having been perversely provoked by someone else's well-aimed witticism. This is my final poem. Its title is Breaking Up. Breaking up is defined by the Encarta World's Dictionary's third meaning. To laugh or cause someone to laugh uncontrollably. That snippet of wit, while undeniably snide, I glibly derided as cutting and dried. Before I deciphered all it had implied, snapped loose a cackle, backed up inside. That crypticism hiddenly triggered my snoodles to snicker, my snorter to snigger, my funny bone twitch tittled by that rib tickler. Wits riddled, I piddled, I spit out a titter, which diddled a giggle loose from my maw to restick like a fish jigger and lodge in my craw. When forgetting all etiquette, I unclenched my jaw Aspirating a hacksawing, humiliating hee-haw. Um, onomatopoetically, beginning with mammals, I re-evolved, guffawing each species of animal. With screeching hyenas breaching my mandibles, my lungs crumbled like humps of Bactrian camels. My throttled vocal cords abraded and frayed, more bottled up chortles out nostrils sprayed, my glottals, now unstoppable, donkey braid. They flailed and degraded with each new, new fusillade. Tears swamped my eyes. I'm cracking up, I cried, in a fit of cachination that finalized my demise. Upon realizing it was myself whom I was beside, with a crisp zipper-like rip, I split my sides. Postscript. I could state my breaking up having abated, that dying of laughter is highly overrated. <laughs> PPS, consider the alternatives. I can't but contemplate I'd have been better off for the mortician's stake had I just laughed my head off. <laughs> PPPS, a caveat. My advice to keep vital, shun redundant aphorists, run from comed comedians. That's unless you're suicidal, then laughter is the best medicine. <laughs> My final PS, before getting swept up in the great cosmic mess, I'd like to get this off what's left of my chest. <laughs> My apologies, Joe. You've snowballed out way out of control. Before that ho-ho's grown cold, you too will implode. Though my humor's half-assed, my one-liner's less than outrageous. Nothing, nothing changes the fact that laughter's highly contagious. <laughs> Sincerely, Amy Woods. The title of this first piece is Gravity. 
It's a serious study of that great scientist, Sir Isaac Newton, who discovered the law of universal gravity when he saw an apple falling in his mother's garden. Gravity. It was a fall from an apple tree far from the plague in Lincolnshire that Isaac contemplated. Did the apple fall by centripetal motion, pulled by an irresistible core, as Isaac enumerated? They say a focus of molten iron gyres and drags things ever down, things like the fruit he calculated. Did he know he'd uncovered the law that rules the rate of the fall of the malice sylvestris as he timed it? then peeled it and ate it. <laughs> the weather was good today. We had no snow. This piece is not about snow. No, it asks what might Charles Darwin have said about the evolution of the automobile. I call it the survival of the motorist. When six tined flakes pile up to make a four foot deep sealed landscape, when the Ford is lost beneath the frost and won't yield to a hand scrape, then why not try just once, deny ourselves the transportation in heaps like these? We'll rent some skis. They'll be our adaptation. <laughs> This one is called Consider the Rest. His pickled lungs and liver sealed in jars, a golden replica upon his face. I can't forget that king whose pious vizier stashed him with spoils to buy eternal life. The undertaker dressed my aunt in velvet. Her nails were varnished red, tight curled her locks. And just before they sealed the satin lid, her daughter dropped aunt's charge cards in the box. <laughs> This next is a villanelle. Some lines repeat. Ether Speak 2010. My message making ways cannot compete with modern wireless satellite telephones. So many kinds of talk are obsolete. To type a memo has become a feat. The older generation still is prone to message-making ways that can't compete with smartphone calls that any minute greet the viewer. Ink and stamps will be unknown. So many kinds of talk are obsolete. My grandchild palms her iPhone just to meet her friends and thumbs the screen in texting mode. Their message-making habits must compete to keep up with the latest buzz or tweet. Passe, the landline, with its dial tone. So many kinds of talk are obsolete. I still rely on email notes to seek replies from distant friends when I'm alone. Although my writing ways cannot compete, their stylish talk will soon be obsolete. <laughs> this is the next to last one. It's called The Trip Up. Above the gentle slope 
another slope appeared, and cresting that upon the path, it chanced, just as I feared, a further hill lay waiting for our eager feet to tread, and ever upward came the word, we'll soon be there, she said. I cut a sturdy ash stick to help me mount the trail. Don't fall behind, she did remind me. There's yet more to scale. The minutes turned to hours. The sun stood overhead. But sure, by now we should somehow arrive, I weakly said. They aren't the same, she breathed. These rocks along the way. I'm not so sure this is the tour I took the other day. <laughs> We're lost. Is that the gist? I pressed for frank disclosure. She nodded, glum. Uh, yes, that's the sum. She dropped her false composure. We never topped the mountain, far peaks to scrutinize. Our aching feet came home to greet the evening's parched black flies. <laughs> Geese in September. Two geese, yapping non-stop, flying low over wind-racked water. Paired for life, this old wing couple, barking for Florida, bitching about the trip. <laughs> Why go so early? We'll hit the hurricanes. Flap it up, can't you? <laughs> Too many tourists. Let's wait a month. Let's not. And so on until they're out of sight. <laughs> Thank you. My first poem is a sonnet, which is the name, the title of the name is a real person who I will tell you really did live in this town called Money. Penny Nichols. <laughs> that pen pal scrawled in green, I live in Money, Mississippi, and I collect dimes. I wrote, but she fell through the cracks, that penny. As life unrolls, I think of her at times. I wonder if she's now a futures broker, plumped on pork bellies and spring wheat, betting whether good or mediocre. Or maybe Penny tips the balance sheet as head trustee of Project Smile, her bucks bringing grins to hapless children's faces. Or Penny frowns, perhaps. She's down on her luck, losing at slots, a tough streak at the races. She lifts her chin. She always charms. Honey, I hear her drawl. Y'all know I come from money. <laughs> Two of my poems today are rather long uh, road trips, uh, imaginary ones, that both were inspired by long car trips on the New York Thruway. The phobics take a field trip. <laughs> <laughs> the phobic club imagined they could dam their flood of foolish fears, large and small, and enjoy a weekend trip to Niagara Falls. but. Right away, they found themselves in jams. When the arithmophobic girl in Buffalo spied the sign for Motel 6, 
she fled. <laughs> Inside the lobby, a speck crept overhead, an arachnophobe backed out. Enough, I'll go. Of course, the claustrophobics quickly took the largest room. They never checked the closet. Bedside, a man unearthed a Gideon deposit. He tore a fit. That bibliophobe is booked. <laughs> they left the ceiling light burning bright when they tucked in twitchy nyctophobe. At three, he woke to see that trusted globe throw sparks and die. And so did he in fright. <laughs> Nightmares plagued the sleepers without stop. At eight, the raccoon-eyed somnophobes were beaming. Not a wink. We're on a roll. Just leave us here and camped in coffee shop. <laughs> the four remaining phobics motored, noses noting others hadn't bathed or showered. At every waving motel sprinkler, they cowered. When they cut the engine at the falls, they froze. The roar, the drop, they couldn't catch their breath. A dreadful thought began to seep and flow. Now we're hydrophobic too? Holy Joe! <laughs> they crumpled at the edge and felt like death. Then one arose and cried in clouds of mist, Where's your necrophobia now? <laughs> that fear of death and dying? You've got to hold it dear. She raised her fist. Use it, friends. Resist. <laughs> <laughs> the haggard phobics stirred and crept away. This exhortation saved them from the brink. They staggered off to toast themselves with drink and live to face their fears another day. <laughs> this uh, very short poem was inspired by Joan's poem, Ether Speak 2010. Tweet, bird of youth. <laughs> All that twitters is not gold. <laughs> and tweets are fleeting. They'll get old. The key is to resist delete. Email is to have and hold. If not in hand, at least in head. Until my Fios line goes dead. <laughs> So here's the other road poem. In this, this is my last poem. In this one, I'm fantasizing about the secret lives of bikers. Poets road rally. Poets hear that siren wail, the lure of the land of the free verse, the call of concrete poetry. <laughs> when trochees turn ignitions, meters jump alive. Quick boots kick stanzas, and they're off in overdrive. <laughs> On a full tonk of gasoline, a honcho with a flying necktie straddles his Suzuki, singing Senryu by ancient masters. Madame Palindrome presses faster on her antique Essa, poetic license tucked in bonnet. One heroic couplet chugs, Claire Hugh and Cry. Little Cry is snug in sidecar, weeping sonnets by the Brownings, drowned out by the gunning of the epic Harley hurtling by. In leather pantoums and tattooed <laughs> I am's. <laughs> that biker bellows body rhyming chains to Eos. He's an oh bad boy. <laughs> Leaning back on ample assonance, hell bent. <laughs> 
hell bent for angel status. Poets roar their lines in freeway lanes and out across the quatrain tracks. <laughs> They're mindless of the little buzzing anapests and jamming in their teeth. <laughs> Octameter needles quiver and freeze in cacophony of carburetor, clutch and pitch and resonator, catalytic euphony, the rhythm of the ditheram at open mic throttle. <laughs> now there's static in the air, a spatter on the asphalt, then the sudden onslaught of a squall. Poets hydroplane through thunder even louder than their own till a metaphoric fork from God ignites imagination's fuel. They howl as they incandesce, turn and volta up to heaven <laughs> on cycles of electric verse. <laughs> this morning I'd like to offer you a bunch of poems that I've written for kids and I realize this is dangerous because as a sage once remarked uh, if you write a poem for children and only children like it it's no good um <laughs> This, this first one is uh, a poem for this season. It's called Snowflakes Souffle. You know how kids like to make up imaginary recipes, uh, including all sorts of horrible stuff? Well, this is an imaginary recipe for a souffle made of snow. And I wrote it just to get a rhythm going. <laughs> That's all. Snowflake souffle, snowflake souffle. Makes a lip smacking lunch on an ice cold day. You take seven snowflakes, you break seven eggs, and you stir them seven times with your two hind legs. <laughs> Bake it in an igloo, throw it on a plate, and you slice off a slice with a rusty ice skate. <laughs> <clears throat> Here, here's one uh, about a, a vulture called, oddly enough, Vulture. <laughs> the vultures, very like a sack, sat down and left there drooping. His crooked beak and creaky back look badly bent from stooping down to the ground to eat dead cows so they won't go to waste, thus making up in usefulness for what he lacks in taste. <laughs> uh, I like to uh, do very, very short rhyming story poems. Uh, here's one called Mother's Nerves. This is the only poem I've ever written that's been banned by the censors. It, it really was. Uh, a book containing a, an anthology was pulled from the shelves of, of the school libraries in North Kansas City, uh, and see if you can see why. It's just four lines long, a small boy is talking, mother's nerves. My mother said, if just once more I hear you slam that old screen door, I'll tear out my hair, I'll dive in the stove. So I gave it a bang and in she dove. <laughs> The, uh, the, the school board in North Kansas City uh, said that this poem was subversive of adult uh, uh, authority. <laughs> Maybe so, but uh, I, I, I thought it was clear it was kidding. But, uh, I, I, I don't know. Anyway. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've, I've had fun writing a series of little short story poems called Brats, and uh, uh, they're usually four lines long. They're about a some bad kid who does something bad and gets his comeuppance. And this isn't a terribly original form. There was a Victorian poet, turn of the century 
20th century poet named Harry Graham, Englishman, who invented a character called Little Willie. And there are many uh, popular poems about Little Willie, some Graham wrote, some anonymous. Uh, oh, a, a sample uh, goes, uh, Little Willie from the mirror licked the mercury all off, thinking in his childish error it might cure the whooping cough. At the funeral, weeping mother sadly said to Mrs. Brown, "'Twas a chilly day for Willie when the mercury went down." <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, here, here's one I did about a, a brat named John. John, while swimming in the ocean, rubbed sharks' backs with suntan lotion. Now those sharks have skin of bronze in their bellies, namely John's. <laughs> um, here's one about a, a brat named Lars who rode his motorbike recklessly. On his motorbike, Lars stands, roaring past us. Look, no hands. Soon, with vacant handlebars, back the bike roars. Look, no Lars. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, uh, not, not only boys are brats. Uh, here's one about Stephanie who took a dip in, well, I'll, I'll read the thing. <laughs> it needs no explanation. <laughs> Stephanie, that little stinker, skinny dipped in fabric shrinker. <laughs> we will find her yet, we hope, once we buy a microscope. <laughs> for, for years, I've been hoping to meet someone named Gosnold for a first name. Is there a Gosnold in the house? No. Um, um, Gosnold, watch out with that match, or the dynamite might catch. There goes Gosnold, living proof that a kid can raise the roof. But uh, my favorite brat is one uh, that I didn't write. It was written by our son, Josh, when he was 12 years old. Uh, uh, I had been saying some of the Bratz poems, and Josh, being a bright lad, picked up what you do. <laughs> you, you do four-line story poem rhyming with uh, hopefully a little surprise at the end. And uh, one night, uh, Dar Dorothy, my wife and I, were shopping uh, in a department store looking for bed sheets. Josh was with us, and he was bored out of his mind. And he started making up this brat poem, uh, just to entertain himself. And he came out with the first three lines. And I said, wow, that's pretty good. Can you come up with one more line to click it shut? And I tried to think how, if this were mine, I would end it. And I, I was totally stumped. So I'm going to give you Josh's brat poem. Uh, I'll give you just the first three lines. Then I'll pause for a moment. And you poets here can think of how, if this were yours, you would end it. Then I'll, then I'll give you the fourth line that all by himself he came up with. <clears throat> Stupid little Lucy Wanket washed her automatic blanket while the thing was still plugged in. <laughs> Notify her next of kin. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 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 Uh, my next to last offering is a rigmarole was the title of my first book for kids uh, One Winter Night in August and uh, you just can see how many uh, impossible things happen in this story. One winter night in August, while the larks sang in their eggs, 
A barefoot boy with shoes on stood kneeling on his legs. At 90 miles an hour, he slowly strolled downtown and parked atop a tower that had just fallen down. He asked a kind old policeman who bit small boys in half, Officer, have you seen my pet invisible giraffe? Why, sure, I haven't seen him, the cop smiled with a sneer. He was just here tomorrow, and he rushed right back next year. Now, boy, come be arrested for stealing frozen steam. And whipping out his pistol, that cop carved some hot ice cream. Just then, a pack of dogfish who roamed the desert snows arrived by unicycle and shook the policeman's toes. They cried, congratulations, old dear, surprise, surprise. You raced the worst, so you came in first, and you didn't win any prize. Then, turning to the boyfoot bear, they yelled, he's overheard. What we didn't say to the officer, we didn't say a word. Too bad, boy, we must turn you into a loathsome toad. Now shut your ears and listen, we're going to explode. But then, with an awful holler that didn't make a peep, our ancient boy, age seven, woke up and went to sleep. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, Bob Clawson uh, in inspired me this morning by his singing to close with... Uh, a song called Great Great Grandma Don't Sleep in Your Treehouse Tonight. Uh, this is a, a sort of down home country music kind of song. <clears throat> great Great Grandma Don't Sleep in Your Treehouse Tonight. Don't swing on your rope and your tire. Cause your tree felt the bite of a mighty termite. Have a seat by the heat of the fire. Here's a big bowl of black bolts and nuts you can crack. Here's some cider to slide down your craw. Oh, what fun it'll be when we roast that old tree. None so tall stands in all Arkansas. Hee haw! <laughs> Mark uh, said that in growing up, music and sports were his two main interests. He began songwriting as a teen and in adulthood, but didn't really get serious about it until he was about 40. So uh, in the last 10 years, he has produced three CDs. He's received first prize in the Great American Song Contest and American Songwriter Magazine's Lyric Contest and also three-time finalist in USA Songwriting Competition. He's received the honorable mention this year's John Lennon Songwriting Contest. Mark said his best memory in sharing a song was singing Hotel Vendome at an annual memorial service honoring those who perished in the fire there years ago. And when asked if he had a funniest mem memory sharing his song with others, Mark said, it's a highlight whenever I have a good crowd and I can get them to sing along with me on singer-songwriter hell. <laughs> so let's see what Mark Stepikoff has in store for us. Please help me welcome Mark Stepikoff. This is great. What a great, great scene you have down here. This is fantastic. So I'm very, very privileged to play here. Um, Cheryl mentioned that I'm a, I'm a sports fan. I said, you know, I can see myself up on the monitor there. It reminds me, you know, sometimes if you're watching a football game or something and, a, you know, a wide receiver, a running back breaks away and there's nobody around them and they're heading for the end zone, you, you notice them slow up at the end so they can look at themselves on the jumbotron. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not to do that. So. Um, anyway, I, over the years I've played a lot of shows. Uh, but I think this is the first show I've ever played in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll start off with a little uh, breakfast-oriented number for you. Look 
up this morning, my head in a fog. I drank like a fish last night and ate like a hog. Won't somebody bring me some hair of the dog? Any place for love, huevos, rancheros. I call Jose Cuervo a personal friend. Should have known that the worm always turns in the end. So call up room service and ask him to send a plate full of huevos rancheros. Huevos rancheros, por favor. For whatever ails you, that's the cure. A bottle of aspirin, a pitcher of sombreros, and a mucho grande plate full of huevos rancheros. Serve them over corn tortillas, very lightly fried. Some rosarita refried beans and salsa on the side. Yes, your stomach will say gracias and your headache will subside with a plate full of huevos rancheros. Huevos rancheros, por favor. And when we're finished, order up some more. Been doing the trick. Since the time of the pharaohs, a mucho grande plate full of huevos rancheros. Another crazy night in store. So join me, mis amigos y todos compañeros, for a mucho grande plate full of huevos rancheros. Yes, a mucho grande plate full, and I will be so grateful. A mucho grande plate full of huevos rancheros. Thank you. You know, there's an old songwriter's adage, you have to write what you know. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to change gears here and, uh, and play a, sort of a spookier number for you. I'm going to try to mix in a couple more serious type numbers with the humorous material. And, uh, so this is kind of a ghost story, I guess. Um, it has as its jumping off point the... Uh, that led, the legend that arose following the death of famed Western figure Wild Bill Hickok. And uh, uh, Wild Bill uh, met his demise in a saloon while playing poker. And legend has it that the hand uh, that he was holding at the time was, uh, was two pair, a pair of aces and a pair of eights. And uh, so you hear references to aces and eights as kind of a harbinger of bad luck in a lot of old folk and blues songs. You know, it's kind of a gambler superstition. Now, that's not a, a good hand to have. So, uh, so that's where the song starts, and then it jumps up to the modern era where uh, our protagonist learns to his regret that uh, you mess with superstition at your peril. Out in Deadwood, South Dakota, a century has passed Since Bill Hickok played the card game that would prove to be his last Never should have sighed where he couldn't see the door As the bullets racked his body, his cards fell down on the floor Dead man's hand Dead man's hand, soon the word spread like wildfire all across the land. Now the aces and dates 
had sealed his fate Dead man's hand Dead man's hand Now you peek at your cards And you try not to smile To purr is the best hand You've been dealt in quite a while And you take another look And it hits you with a jolt A little voice is telling you to fold your cards and bolt Dead man's hand, dead man's hand Time to ask yourself, are you a superstitious man? With aces and dates, do you tempt fate? Dead man's hand Some fool throws half his stack in, but you know he's holding nothing. Cause he taps his fingers on the table every time he's bluffing. And another fella calls him, and the guy next to you raises. You tell yourself you haven't seen a pot this big in ages. There's a knot in your stomach and a lump is in your throat. You stayed in with your two pair, lost out to a sixes boat. In the sky there's thunder booming, though there's not a drop of rain. Is that wild bill reaching out for you, calling out your name? That man's hand, that man's hand. Of the damned with aces and dates, you sealed your fate. Dead man's hand, dead man's hand, dead man's hand, dead man's Thank you. Um, well, when Cheryl first invited me to, to play here for you today, uh, uh, she she gave me you know kind of the, the lay of the land, and she I think she says this to all the performers. It wasn't anything about me, but she says just you know keep in mind uh, you have to keep the material family oriented. This is being taped for television, and uh, uh, taking no chances. I said, C can you define what you mean by that? And uh, she said, well, uh, you know, if you can get away with it on primetime television, it's probably okay, you know. And, uh, uh, my kids watch a lot of primetime television, and um, so my reaction to that was that that leaves a lot of room. <laughs> and so uh, I think we'll be okay with this one soon. Up the scent of 
love some Stetson cologne. A little fresh meat sure tastes good off the bone. Then out come the clouds as she's wiping down his fevered brow. He's just a little bit of catnip. His kitty is a cougar. Enjoyed uh, hearing um, the Light Brigade and all the spoken word uh, artists today. Um, I, I really admire what you do. Uh, in the same way, I admire anybody that has skills that I don't have. You know, and um, sometimes you know I'll, I'll tell people I can't really write poetry, and you know, say, "What do you mean? You're a songwriter?" You know, and uh, but uh, I think anybody who, who either you know writes poetry or songs knows that. Um, even though there are some poems that can be set to music and there are some songs that have you know, poetic elements to it, they're, uh, they're really two different crafts. And uh, so uh, I appreciate you guys letting me be part of your world today. So, uh, so um, uh, last week, I guess it was la last Friday, was uh, it would have been the 75th anniversary of, or would have been the 75th birthday of Elvis Presley. And uh, it's just kind of hard to fathom, I think. And um, um, so this song uh, was inspired by um, the great biography of Elvis that was written by uh, Peter Goralnik. And it's called uh, Last Train to Memphis is the name of the book. And uh, it's a wonderful book, especially if, you're, if you have any interest in, in Elvis. And if you have any interest kind of in American culture, then it's hard not to have an interest in, in Elvis. Um, it does a very nice job of kind of, of, of humanizing Elvis, and um, it has a, a, a lot of information uh, about Elvis's upbringing and childhood. And um, uh, one of the scenes it, it describes in, in quite a bit of detail was when uh, Elvis's uh, father, Vernon, uh, moved the family from... Um, uh, Mississippi to uh, Tennessee when uh, Elvis was 13 and uh, in a lot of ways that was kind of a seminal event of, of Elvis's childhood it opened up a whole new world to him so so this song kind of uh, tries to take a snapshot of that moment in time and um, I think what I was trying to convey uh, in the song is that uh, that uh, ultimately uh, no matter who we are even Elvis uh, we're all uh, products of our upbringing and uh, that as parents, the, uh, the things we do and the choices we make can affect our children in, uh, in, in incalculable ways. The war was finally over and the boys were all back home. Truman was elected to a full term of his own And the country was returning 
to a sense of normalcy when Vernon moved from Tupelo to Memphis, Tennessee. He had lived in Tupelo since he was 17. But the times he'd held a steady job were few and far between. And folks knew about his stint down in the penitentiary. So Vernon moved from Tupelo to Memphis, Tennessee. He packed up his wife and his sole surviving son. Still wondering why the good Lord had to take the other one. A dozen years had come and gone, but not the memory. When Vernon moved from Tupelo to Memphis, Tennessee. On the streets of Memphis, everybody knew the rules. There were white and colored churches, there were white and colored schools. And that was never gonna change as far as anyone could see when Vernon moved from Tupelo to Memphis, Tennessee. Well, meanwhile, down on Beale Street, something new was in the air. The blues would ring out day and night, and all were welcome there. And the radio was playing all the latest R&B when Vernon moved from Tupelo to Memphis, Tennessee. Just another good old boy moving out of state. Just a hundred mile drive up Route 78. Whoever would have guessed he'd be making history when Vernon moved from Tupelo to Memphis, Tennessee. When Vernon moved from Tupelo to Memphis, Tennessee. When Vernon moved from Tupelo. To Memphis, Tennessee. Okay. All right. So, uh, thanks again for listening. Um, I got CDs out on the table there for ten dollars each. Um, once you get tired of them, they make lovely coasters. All right, so um, uh, I like my, uh, my performances to be educational and informative as well as entertaining. So uh, I'm going to leave you uh, with uh, this, this number, which uh, tells the tale of a, uh, a very important, though sadly neglected, figure in world history. In the season of the dragon, near the province of Hunan. A brave young Chinese general crushed the rebels of Nian. Well, you can scour your history books, his name will not be found. But it's recognized in every Chinese takeout joint in town. General Gao. General Gao. The bravest man in China, but he's just chicken now. The ginger and the garlic make it all taste right somehow. Let's have another piece of General Gao. He drove the Taiping army from the city of Nanjing. And his name became a legend in the dynasty of Qing. If you don't see the irony, you must be pretty jam. General Gao, General Gao, fearless and courageous, 
but he's just chicken now. When Nixon went to China and had lunch with Chairman Mao, they had a great big dish of General Gao. It's said that when the general was about to pass away, his men asked if he'd any final words he'd like to say. He turned to his lieutenant and said, write this down. I'm thinking chicken fried in sesame oil might taste pretty good. Well, there's Wellington and Stroganoff, a beef dish named for each. And Caesar had his salad, and Melba had her peach. But on this list, the general's name you surely must include someone with his accomplishments ought not to be. General Gao, General Gao, the bravest man in China, but he's just chicken now. And if I had one wish that God would promise to allow, I'd say praise the Lord and pass the General Gao. Praise the Lord and pass the General Gao. I've had a very heavy week of writing a screenplay about domestic violence um, this week and uh, watching the things unfold in Haiti. So I want to thank Cheryl for providing us all, but me in particular, with a little levity this morning. As Cheryl mentioned, I'm a screenwriter, but occasionally I'll write short fiction or I'll write an essay. This is one of my essays that's been published a few times, but most recently for an online blog called MomsWhoNeedWine.com. Okay. <laughs> what are you doing, I said. We don't pee in the flowers. We pee in the potty. My voice did not stop him midstream. It did, however, cause him to turn and look at me, and as, <laughs> and as a result, he peed all over the deck. I calmly explained to him that people pee in the potty, not outside. He said he understood. Three days later, as I loaded the dishwasher, my older ch child exclaims, Mom, Patrick pooped his pants. Sure enough, there was my son with his shorts around his ankles, waddling like a penguin. I quickly grabbed him and whisked him off to the bathroom to clean him up. First, I attended to his bottom. Now, I classify messes on a one to a five wipe scale. This wasn't bad. It was a two wipe mess. <laughs> then I took off his shoes and I had him step carefully out of his shorts and his underpants, anticipating the mess that awaited me. But when I peered inside, his underpants were dry and empty. Patrick, where's the poop, honey? My naked three-year-old smiled. He took my hand, and he led me through the kitchen and the living room, out the back door, and across the lawn to the front of the swing set. <laughs> and there on the lawn was a large log about 18 inches long. Now, if I had discovered this myself, I would have sworn that a Clydesdale had been in my backyard. <laughs> As the initial shock started to wear off, it occurred to me that any mother worth her salt would use this as lesson material. Patrick, we go in the potty. I chided my brazen, bare-ass child. We don't go outside. But as it were, he was more interested in the size and the consistency of his achievement. <laughs> Look, Mommy, it's so big. And as the two of us hunched over the object of his pride, it became obvious to me that he wasn't getting the point. <laughs> Honey, why did you poop on the lawn? Because Otis does, he replied. Yes, but Otis is a dog, and you're a big boy, and big boys use the potty. 
What happened next can only be described as one of the true tests of motherhood. Our dog Otis, an English Springer, who by nature is a bird dog, spied the two of us looking at something in the grass. And with canine determination, he swooped in rapidly, and before I had a chance to shoo him away, he grabbed Patrick's pride and chomped it down. <laughs> the echoes of my shrieks were only drowned out by my son's shrieks of horror. Otis ate my poo! Otis ate my poo! Otis, put that down, I yelled. Bad dog! Bad dog! <laughs> Mommy, is Otis going to die? <laughs> Patrick asked after his traumatic meltdown, terribly concerned. I hope not, I said, but he might get very sick. I, I don't want Otis to be sick. Well, I don't want him to be sick either, honey. And I don't want him to die. Well, Patrick, let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> I reasoned only as a mother could. You go in the potty, not outside, so you don't kill the dog. My second poem is Writing for Timothy. Saul converted our walk-in closet into a writing room with a second hand for Micah's school desk and attached chair. The light in this modest room was pale like an afterthought, the closet air dank and porous with the scent of denim work shirts and leather boots stained with paint. The unwashed blue jeans of his brother, dead now for 12 years. On weekends, Saul would retreat to this berth to write about the life they had growing up in India and New Hampshire, adolescents in icy mountains, wild boys with crampons and ice picks, Roped together, finding sure footing, companions of survival. It was Timothy who missed his step on the mountain and left his brother alone in that closet, writing of their life together as if to bring him back. I'm just sharing one poem today. It's called California. <clears throat> Must be nice to be always leaving in your mind, another westward expansion, another million miles, like geese in late autumn stretching onward, advancing silent into open cobalt sky. Write me lines on a postcard when you get there about how the surf rolls up against the shoreline, <clears throat> releasing tiny bubbles that drain away suddenly, one at a time. This is the motion that you long for, this pulling you back, dissolving, beginning at the beginning again, an endless loop of starting over. But wait, tell me also how the sun shines on glass top water, softened by the coming dusk, while undulations rock you gently as a gull, lolling on swells that tip at the horizon. I'd like to know about your sunlit journey for unlike you, I'll still be here, scraping my fingers through crystals on the window, peering out at long blue shadows, watching as the wind sails brown leaves along the surface of the snow, skittering sideways like ancient crabs. <clears throat> so the first one I'm going to read is called Content. Beautiful, you scare me still, as your eyes close in for the kill. On my heart, as I stare at you, you look away and nothing's new. But as we move into a new year, I have shed more than just one tear. And if parting is such sweet sorrow, tell me why do I dread tomorrow? And oh, the window to your soul, where I see a fire lit like a coal. Directionless, where do we go, when we doubt all of which we know? So now I am on one knee, but there's no place I would rather be. So when there's nothing left to say, take my hand, love, and run away. And the second one I'm going to read has no title. I think that this is summer's end, where a flash of romance blows away, blows away the sand, out to sea, so emotional. Would you like to see the sun on top of a rain cloud? The view is next to none. We should go. Strangely magical. 
Oh, and all you can't ignore. Could you understand? When I say that I need you now, I mean take me as I am. This must be how logic ends, with the sidewalk meeting right where the road ends. Let's just be over tentative. Would you like to see the woods in Massachusetts? It's so romantic. Maybe we should go. So predictable. Oh, and all you can't ignore. Could you understand? When I say shut up and leave me be, I mean take me as I am. So this is a well-known American folk song um, written down and widely performed, written down by A.P. Carter and widely performed by the Carter family, but it is in fact a very ancient song, most likely from Scotland, uh, that uh, made its way to this country with our immigrants. And you probably all know the storms are on the ocean. Mama 
How's everyone doing? Good. <laughs> Just want to thank Cheryl for putting me back on the list. I was supposed to be here earlier. Um, I'm investigating with the states we had an emergency to contend with before coming here, so I want to thank Cheryl for that. Um, I also have a book out. Uh, it's called Purification, Cleansing of a Contaminated Soul. You can check that out. Um, what I write in there is a little bit more deep than what I'm going to read today. What I'm reading today, I try to keep it on the theme of humor because that was the whole thing today. Uh, this first one's called Why I'm Here With You. I've been seeing this woman outside my marriage for five years now. I meet with her some months less frequently than others. She has gotten to know me quite well. I know very little of her. However, I feel comfortable with her, except she keeps asking me the same things. Why do you think that? Why do you think you do that? Hell if I know, that's what I'm here for. The second one's called Dental Cleaning in Comparison with Relationships. I made my regular six-month dental appointment. The hygienist, not particularly good-looking, but fair, utilized her skills to get these not-so-pearly whites clean. I wonder what she thought of the inside of my mouth, how many mouths she glances at in a day, and whether this has an impact on her personal relationships. <laughs> she scraped, I spit. She spa polished, I spit. She flossed, I spit. I was then looked at for the final, by, for the final inspection by the dentist. She poked, she prodded, and continued to poke, poke, poke on each tooth until I finally said, if you poke harder and long enough, I'm sure a hole will develop that you can fill. <laughs> She laughed and cleared me with a good bill of health. Relationships are the same. If people continue to poke and prod, you will eventually find something you don't like and realize that you can't truly fill the void you created. Thank you.